Is that the right position, firstly? And, and you can all hear me. I'm, uh, I'm often accused of speaking very loudly, so I don't really need the mic. My wife is always telling me, please put it down, put it down. So I think we can. Um, I've, most of my talks and lectures have been directed or are addressing architecture, architectural professionals, the design industry. So when I was asked to come and speak here, and then I was also sent a format because um, I've been known to meander. I've been known. I always give the example of, uh, let's say, Pandit Shiv Sharma, that he comes on stage and he takes 12 to 15 minutes to unveil his instrument. And then he will sort of tune it. And somebody will ask, why didn't you do this at home, man? Why are you doing it here? So, but it's a, uh, you know, so some of us old timers, and I'm an old timer is, you know, sort of we, we, we have this thing of meandering. But uh, I've been told, in fact, my son told me that you've got to, uh, you know, get on there and you have your specified time and so on. So, so let's get on with it. Uh, mine is a slightly different take. I've uh, looked at the subject of, I mean, I see the majority of you sitting here, I see students, I see aspirations. I see what am I going to be? What am I going to do? These are fundamental to when we are in school or go before we go to university or even in university. This is a very, very relevant, it's a very important question that is before us. And for me, the I call it, which you see up there, is realizing your potential which is both unique and infinite. So we'll start to get into these words one by one. Potential, we'll come to it a little later. But let's say, why unique? Because each one of us is completely unique. There's not a single person amongst billions who has the same cornea, the same fingerprint, or the same DNA. We are completely unique. So that is very important that you realize this, because we are constantly comparing that I, you know, and we are, you know, that I want to be that person. Please realize you're unique. Whatever it is, you are unique. And it's very important to realize that. The second, why I say infinite. This body, this mind, is composed of eight billion cells. It's a complete cosmos. And it is definitely full of infinite possibilities. We have seen that expressed in so many people down the years from, I mentioned the word Rabindranath Tagore, uh, Einstein on the other side. So we have infinite possibility. So we then say that, okay, I have these two parameters, unique, the possibilities are infinite. How do I discover and how do I get into these possibilities? What is the methodology? Okay. Question, what do you want to be in life? Who or what decides? Now, we are always, I was with, I was, in Uzbekistan a week back, and I was with my nephew, somewhere that kind of age group. And the first question you ask, I asked, you asked that young man is, where are you studying? I'm studying in the international school. And, uh, and what are you going to do? Well, what is it that you enjoy doing? And uh, so it's the first question you would always ask of anybody. And he said, you know, I'm not very clear. You know, I'm good in maths. I like physics a little bit, but um, literature, so and so. So I asked him a simple question. I said, uh, young man, there's a park not far from your house, 10 minutes walking distance. Now he must be wondering, what 
the hell is this connection with this guy, you know? He's just come in here, he's been, not even been here 24 hours. And he's talking, he's talking about this subject and then talking about a park in the same breath. So I told him, have you been there? No, you know, it's very cold and I, I know it's there, but I've never been. In the first morning I was there, I was in the park. It was absolutely exquisite. The birds were chirping. The colors of fall of russets and golds was happening there. The sun was filtering through the trees. And, and I told him, I said, that ultimately, to realize this, you have to change direction. This centrifugal must become centripetal. The direction has to change. You must know a little bit about nature. And, and so, so we come to it, who finally decides, certainly, you're doing well, you know that these are your aptitudes. There are teachers who are directing you there. There will be counselors, there will be guides. But finally, and all this is necessary. I'm for one moment not saying I'm anti this. No, no, no. It's a, it's a nice process. It's like education itself. But are they really the final? Uh, are they really going to decide where you're going to be? Who knows this? And then we come to the next part, which is the only person who really knows you is yourself. So now we start touching upon what is called or termed to be a highly complex subject. To me, it's amazingly simple. And therefore, I will, you know, so I will pick up the threads and move on to this thing. That, what is this journey? Who is this? The word your we know, we understand. Self. What is this word? And how do you really get to it? So this particular talk is is getting is going to be a little bit of a journey. And it's not a journey which has to do with dogmas, theories, and so on and so forth. It is an experiential journey. And it's a journey which came upon me. I didn't undertake that journey. So I will, I will, as we go along, try and share a little bit of something which you may find maybe a little abstract, maybe expressed in metaphors. You know, it's one plus one, two, no. So we talked about the quest for the self. Right. Now, let's start to, when we start to look and approach a subject, I think we need to have a certain language, a certain syntax. So I say first, learn the art of listening. What is this? Let's say, for example, I'm speaking. And just as those words have reached you, you have sometimes either accepted or rejected them straight away. Listening or deep listening is something else. It means don't interfere with what is coming through to you. You have plenty of time later to say, I accept it or I reject it. But first, let it come through which means that you need to reduce the amount of noise going on inside the head at any given moment, and then you receive what is coming. Later on, you can, you, you, you can take your call whether it's something acceptable to you or not. Awareness. You, become, you should become extremely aware. And that awareness comes through being in that moment. You always find that this mind is always somewhere else. It's never here. It's always on the other bank. That's the, the very nature. So you need to be aware, means you need to be in the moment. Third, experiential. And this is what I said, that there are lots of things that we can talk. They're about words. They're about theories, dogmas, doctrines. But there is one thing which we call experiential, which is something that you have experienced only then are you really qualified to speak about it? And then existential. This journey we are talking about 
is not divergent from life. It's very much part of mainstream life. It's about, uh, it's, it goes alongside. We always tend to say that, look, if you are going to go on this kind of a search, it's at the cost of this. You have to forsake this. No, it's very much part of our everyday life. It's very much part of the journey that we have. So it's not a divergent journey that we need to undertake. We move on to come to the subject of, as we start to go deeper, let's get into the four eyes, and particularly for the kids there. First one, intellect. What is intellect? Because we certainly get into the dictionary, but let's get a little deeper into what is the meaning of intellect. Intellect deals with something which has been given to you, which has been borrowed right from the time you were born to the present stage that you are. Whether it came from parents, it came from teachers, it came from, it ultimately comes in life, it comes from universities, it'll come from buses, it'll come from books, it'll come from media, but it is something completely borrowed. None of this is your own, it's borrowed. We come to the next one, instinct. This is a word which has been pushed into the basement. We've added a prefix to it. Whenever we use the word instinct, there's a prefix of animal added to it. We've forgotten what this word is. This is something you have been born with. It's intrinsically part of you. Now, let's, let's start to look at uh, what, what does it really mean? Let's say, I feel hungry, I eat food. When my body says I need food, I eat food. That's what the animal does. It also, feeling hungry, will eat food. Doesn't require food for the next two or three days, will not eat. But us, it's not. So we do not live things, because he leaves things, absolutely, he leaves things absolutely to the body. The body says I want to eat, I respond. With us, the issue starts to, the problem starts when it moves from awareness of the body that we get to, it goes to the mind. So things of the body, when they start moving to the mind, then start all the problems that we have. They come out of repression, and we see it all around us. You look at it today, you have such a high degree of depression, of mental illness, a lot of it happens when you're actually pushing things to the mind which have no business to be there. There are things of the heart, leave them there. There are things with the body, leave them there, and, and, and they settle down. But we push everything up there, and that's where you find the clamor and all the noise there. It's very interesting for you kids that one day, just pick up a paper and a pencil, lock yourself in the room for half an hour, and simply jot down whatever thought comes into your head. Don't hold it back. Don't try and censor it. Don't cut it. Whatever comes, just note it down. I will tell you, and I can promise you, that you will never show that paper to anybody. It is for the first time that you will start to get an idea of what's going on here. It makes you aware of what's really going on here. It will surprise you, and it will shock you. Is this what's going on in my head? It's very important. Third one we come to is intelligence. Now this is something again born with us. And the more and the quieter you become, intelligence starts to surface. And intelligence, the pinnacle of intelligence is that you come to number four, which is intuition. Now, for the first time, something, there is a possibility of something which is not borrowed emerging. We call it creativity, you can call it anything, but the bottom line is this, that this is the first time that there is a possibility of something that is going to come which is not borrowed from someone else. Okay. I will, uh, <clears throat> being an architect, I will take you through a little journey 
because <clears throat> when you when you go to a particular site and this particular site was in Alibag I was to do a house for an industrialist and when you normally ask a person that when you go to a site what do you do oh you have this vision that I want things to look like this and this is how I visualize things for me and I will step back five and a half decades at least so that I'm your age you can now begin to gauge my age okay. I was born in the Himalayas in the mountains and I spent my entire childhood there it's important because I told you I'll talk to you about a journey and I was surrounded by nature every day I would ride a horse there were hardly any motor cars on the road it's a very strange and bizarre scenario that you can paint in you know you can picture surrounded by nature surrounded by fruit orchards you wake up sometimes early morning and everything had turned white and somewhere this connect this trying to understand nature and I use this word very you know very freely is that I fell in love with nature it's all around me and I fell in love with it and when you fall in love I think some of you have to wait a little bit to do that uh, you you want to get closer and you want to understand this language how do you communicate with nature at this point there was intervention and I will not go into the details of it but to communicate with nature the only language is that of silence it's extremely important to understand this word it is not the absence of external noise it's the absence of noise inside so if you have you want to be close to nature you want to embrace nature and the language of communication because you want it so badly is silence I would like to steer clear and I would of the esoteric but let it suffice that this inquiry this quest that we talked about as we started for the self is more than 5,000 years ago at least recorded so it's not something I have conjured up it's not something I have contributed or bought here it's been around so there are and it's very interesting 112 known methods of meditation 112 but that's a complex subject let's get let's make it simple the common thread the common thing there is witnessing that's all we simply become a witness your awareness heightens and you become a witness so you go through that process and you finally realize that as you come closer to nature that you are part of it you're not divergent from it you are very much part of it we are always trying to dominate nature we're always trying to you know but we don't understand that we are an intrinsic part of it it is then that when you come close to nature that you actually come close to the self it's at that point that you'll find that a lot of burden on you of making choices of stress you know you develop a lot of inner strength you become fearless so all of these qualities come in which help you determine where you will finally go for me this was the journey and I will explain to you that coming to a site does this really work this kind of thinking does it really work so let's go to a site I go to a site and I see hundreds of trees I go to a site not as an architect or as a designer but I go there with reverence I go there I would walk a couple of hours 
went around, I saw the trees. I saw there were a few bald spots between the trees which would give me the only possibility of building because to cut a tree is heresy. Would never step on that. I, would, I looked at the sun, how it moved through in those couple of hours. You know how the sun trajectory is going. You understand what are the water sources. There were two wells on the site and how I would be able to be self-sustaining. So you actually realize that you went there, I went there, or I go there without baggage completely. I don't go there with an idea that this is what I want to do. I go there completely blank. And I go there with the reverence that I go with, to nature and saying, OK, please guide me now that I am here. And from then on, we, if you see the diagram on the right here, bald spots picked up on the site, connected through. And that's where we said that we had the possibility to construct. How and what do you do when you start to approach the design process here? The next part, after looking at all the parameters which I call sustainability, directly connected with nature, then we start to look at what is the memory of the place? What is, what is the meaning of memory? Memory means how did they traditionally build here? High rainfall areas. What kind of local materials were there? They use clay tiles. It's, it's, it's typical Konkan architecture. It was wood, clay tiles, and so on. So you really got into understanding that how they really built, which was completely sustainable. Now, that also looks at things uh, you know, climatically. It looks at insulation. It looks at the amount of light coming through. It also looks at deep shaded spaces, which you need in the tropical climate and so on. So all of this is actually the memory of the place which you begin to start to filter through and begin to sort of induct into the matrix that you call design. So over time, you find there are layers that start to happen. There is a layer of sustainability. There's a layer of memory and layer of function. After all, the client says, this is what I need. And all these various layers start to pile up one on top of the other. And still, there is no design. Because somewhere through this, you begin to see an image start to appear, maybe faint, but start to appear. So, so what, has the, what has the architect been doing all along? What, is, what have I been doing all along? I've actually become a catalyst. If you'll ask me that if you got all these influences and you did this, what, what on earth have you done? You know? But I've become a catalyst. Something else is dictating this whole process. It's moving through. Nature moves through you. You become the catalyst. So we move on. Now, we, we started to look at the fact that when you look at a tree, what does it say? It's got a trunk and it's got branches. It has minimum impact on the ground. So our entire structural system is based and inspired by the tree. We all see these trees, you know, every day we see them. But there are things that when, as I said, you get close to it, then you view it in a completely different way. So we looked at that, and we looked at very slender supports hitting the ground. And from there, tree-like branches that support the roofs. Now, this also means minimum intrusion onto the ground. Because when we say sustainable, I don't also, also, I don't also want to dig the entire ground up. So we simply come to a particular point, and then from there take the branches, and they hold the roof there. And this particular slide shows that. And somewhere where the tree is growing, and it's growing through the roof, but well, it grows through the roof. You know? So the question always comes, what came first, the house or the tree, which is wonderful. Sustainability on water. And how do you handle the wells that are there? How do you charge the wells during the rains, and so on and so forth? How do you make this house sustainable, completely sustainable on water? So you can look at the diagrams which, where you can see how uh, the, the, the water charging systems and so on and so forth are made. I will not get too much into details. But the idea is that when you talk about sustainability, it's not a myth. It's not something out there. It's not leads rating. It's not points. It's, it's really about a lot of common sense. It ceased to exist, and we would have lost an immense uh, amount of wealth and richness that we have in the tapestry and the possibilities that we have. So, whilst, so 
this is what we did. And uh, as he puts, so I've got a two minute clip of what happened with this place. You know, that uh, uh, I've given you the inputs, this is how we approach the concept and so on and so forth. Uh, this is how nature came through. And I'll leave you a little bit to see the images of what happened as I walk away from this house. So I'll ask you one question at the end of this. That I leave it to you to decide that. That what was my contribution to this? I, I simply said, learnt the art of listening. Go there, and I saw everything. I worked in consonance with nature. I. I kept myself patriotic. I came without baggage. I came without preconceived notions. And this can only, only happen if you start, as I said, to move A into silence and then into the self. <laughs>